Hello, and today we're going to be looking at macroeconomic objectives. Now, before we begin, just so you know, there are written notes of this video on my website. And before we do continue with the video, I just want to mention a few words about the importance of understanding macroeconomic objectives. Now, the point is, when you do an AS economics course, you are introduced to macroeconomics. You're looking at aggregate demand and supply in the economy. You're looking at policies such as fiscal, monetary, supply side, demand side. Well, demand side is monetary and fiscal, but you know what I mean? And you're looking at how does this impact aggregate demand and supply? How does this, um, you know, ultimately go on to impact you as an individual? Now, you can't understand this if you don't know like why you would pursue certain policies or why a certain aggregate demand and supply equilibrium is wrong you have to understand this from the um, from the perspective of objectives now the state the government that controls the economy has objectives now there can be four types of macroeconomic objectives there are an additional two we will discuss in this video and each state, each government, um, at each period of time in history will have their own preferences. Now, what I want to do in this video is go through these six objectives and then evaluate and see that really is this the best um, uh, objective to pursue. Surely we should pursue a different one. So before we start, what are the economic growth, inflation, balance of payments and unemployment, employment, and then you have in the environment and distribution of income, which are these kind of sideline objectives. They're not the main economic ones. So um, let's start with the first one, economic growth. What do we mean by this? It's it's basically increases in potential output income. Why might any government want to pursue economic growth? Well, it's fairly straightforward. There's data which correlates greater um, economic growth to higher incomes and a better quality of life and standards of living for people. So the government, you know, it wants to be popular with the public. They want to be voted in again. And also, what is their purpose to better the lives of the community, the individuals? And the data suggest a way to do this is economic growth. Now, we're going to look at why some people might argue that the government shouldn't fo focus on um, a macroeconomic objective of economic growth. So what are they? Well, if you look at stuff like the recession, the financial recession of 2008, where, you know, we went into negative growth, it basically implies that economic growth isn't actually in the hands of government. It's a cyclical thing that we've seen with the um, business um, trade cycle. It's not really in the hands of government. So why should government be, you know, spending money trying to increase people's um, incomes when ultimately it's a cyclical thing? Should the government really be worried about growth? Why is it when we look at monetary policy, we're trying to connect it with growth? Should we really be bothered if it's not in the hands of the government to begin with? And this ties on to the point about there are some people that believe in market economics and then there's some people who believe in uh, government intervention. If you go on to study economics later on, you'll be looking at Keynes and the neoclassicists. But I don't want to talk about that too much because this is quite an intense video and I have a lot to get through. Um, the other thing is growth, um, like if we look at the data, it suggests where's the best growth coming from? Emerging markets. Why is this? Because they have a spare capacity of resources, land, labor, um, and anyway, the main one is labor that we need to talk about. And um, so because they have this spare capacity, they can grow. We can tie this in with the Lewis model um, over here. So should the governments really be bothered when things like this happen automatically? That's the key word here. It's automatic. And the final point is some people say, why are you so focused with what the percentage of rate of growth is? What's more important is how that growth um, is achieved. So if we look at the Soviet model um, e um, uh, model of economic growth, then basically how did they grow at these extortionary rates? What they did is they increased output by replacing labor with capital. And some people say that, you know, that's just not right. And that in the long run, that makes people unemployed and it's not fair and da 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 da. So that's another argument. And the final thing is, 
you know, I have an essay uploaded, I think, on my uh, blogs, on my website, where it's basically talking about how economic growth goes hand in hand with the environment. But some people say, because evidence shows the more developed a country, the more economic growth uh, one has, the more dire consequences we see on the environment. And so the government should not be focusing, and that's another trade-off in economic growth and environment. And I'm not sure I talk about that in my trade-offs video, but it's something to look more into when you're looking at macroeconomic objectives and whether that is one to be pursued. So other people say economic growth government should not pursue. If we take the main argument it's not in the hands of the government. So what is the second macroeconomic objective that the government could pursue? Which is the control of inflation. What does that mean? It means preventing prices from rising too quickly. Now, there's two types of inflation. You have demand, pull inflation and cost push. Essentially, I have video on inflation as well. But what they mean is a demand pull inflation is when the increases in uh, price rises are caused by too much pressure on aggregate demand. Um, you know, i.e. too much spending, uh, whereas cost push is where, for example, the cost of raw materials such as food goes up and this um, puts strain on aggregate supply and causes prices to rise. Now, why might one be concerned with controlling of inflation? Well, it has many consequences. For example, if as a nation our prices go up, um, especially in regards to other countries, it goes up much faster, then we go down in international competitiveness because our products become more expensive and this can have dire consequences on the balance of payments which we'll talk about because that's another uh, uh, macroeconomic objective so you can see how they're all intertwined and linked to one another then you have um, the fixed incomes uh, people on fixed income well basically what happens is if inflation goes up it affects them um, uh, more negatively because they're on a fixed income which means they have less disposable income unless their incomes are to rise in real terms that would be the only kind of catch-22 thing and then also there's the other thing that if inflation is really high the most popular way of controlling it is monetary policy which I have video on again you can have a look at what do we do in monetary policy? We tighten it, i.e. we make it um, more higher the interest rates and to control inflation. But this is also controversial because then you're trying to limit borrowing, encourage saving, and then you negatively impact growth. Is that something you want to do? And also increasing growth can attract speculation. And when we look at balance of payments, now the current account, you know, this won't affect, but you know, the other accounts, the surplus uh, speculation will affect. So you will have a problem there. So all these reasons makes us want a government to be focused on inflation control. But why might this be like a not so good objective to fulfill? Well, there are many reasons. The first is statistics relating to inflation. They can be adjusted um, by index linking and we can very easily move them around. And it depends on, for example, with CPI, what are the products in the basket? So there's a lot of issues with inflation when it comes to statistics and calculating and measuring it. Um, then also, it's hard to know whether inflation is caused by um, demand pull or cost push. And so what happens is sometimes it's caused by a rise in um, raw materials such as food or oil or whatever it is. But the government does not know that. And the only policy they have is tightening um, interest rates. So they tighten interest rates, which is a demand based policy and then we we have all sorts of problems because that impacts you know economic growth and all these things we already talked to and yet inflation is not going to be controlled at all so it was basically a load of time waste um and the other thing is again as i talked about um you you increase speculation and also you can make the currency go higher which is not good for um uh international competitiveness um 
hot money comes into the country, which is another way of saying speculation. That's another thing we talked about. And then balance of payments is affected. So we talked about all of these things. So now let's move on quickly because it's already hitting like 10 minutes to the third goal, which is um, the government might want to look at employment and how to uh, how to reduce unemployment as opposed to growth and inflation. Because one, they might say we don't control it and inflation. They might say, well, we don't know like whether it's uh, aggregate demand or aggregate supply that's causing it. Thus, how can we react um, effectively? Let's focus on unemployment. And uh, what do we mean by reducing unemployment? Well, the number of people who are willing to work um, but are not working um, should be no more than 2%. That's a kind of benchmark figure that's usually um, used. And we have four types of unemployment. Now, I have a video which goes into depth, so I really want to keep this really, really brief. So the first is a cyclical unemployment, which is basically... Um, where there's a lack of spending or there's a recession, uh, it's sometimes called the demand deficit unemployment, and um, that's the type of uh, so people are unemployed because there isn't enough demand um, for uh, the labour because there's a lack of spending, you know, etc. And this is a problem because unemployment, you know, uh, can lead to a multiply. Then those people stop working, then more people get laid off and become unemployed. So you can see it's a cycle. It's called cyclical. Now, what is the problem with a government trying to solve issues of cyclical unemployment by us giving injections and in spending um, uh, in the public sector, for instance, as a way of dealing with this? Well, firstly, the size of the multiplier caused by the unemployment is not always that significant. So the government might have more important thing, they, uh, more important things that they should be worrying about. So people uh, who support that. Uh, um, they should uh, look for inflation. They might say inflation is more important than unemployment because the size of the um, uh, multiplier in unemployment is not so significant. Then you also have stuff like, can the government really afford to spend money uh, on injecting government spending when there's a fiscal deficit of this size that we have right now? And don't forget the there's time lags with government spending. And then also the classical economists talk about it being essentially why do we have this cyclical unemployment is because people are not willing to accept the lower uh, wages which is what the market dictates they want higher wages so as soon as they learn to accept that which is something they will do if the government doesn't intervene and support them then we can get the market working fine so the government should not worry that's what they would say the other type of unemployment uh, is structural unemployment. So what do we mean by structural unemployment? It's when labor doesn't have enough um, skill to move to another sector. So the classic example given is when you have people who are miners and the mining industry closed down and then jobs prop up in, say, the IT sector. However, they cannot move to the IT sector because they don't have the relevant skills. So what should the government do in this situation? Well, they can train the people themselves with training programs like the New Deal or whatever. And the other thing is they can give firms subsidies and legislate so that firms train more people. Now, people would say, is it really worth government resources um, to be spending money uh, doing this, you know, subsidizing or creating training programs? Because here we're talking about large amounts of money. So there's an opportunity cost involved. Then you can use opportunity cost also the cost of uh, training these people versus the benefit of training these people is it really worth it when the vast majority of the population has the skills to cope or shall we just wait for the next generation is there really a point over time they may disappear um, and if the government doesn't intervene then people themselves might take initiative and train themselves why should we bother? It's their responsibility. That's what some people say. Then you have frictional unemployment, which means it's a type of unemployment when you're between jobs. So how can the government address this? Well, they can improve information, the flow of information, and there's the whole information economics you can have a look at. And the second thing is they can extend the services provided by job centers. So to reduce this kind of unemployment. Now, 
this obviously costs money and again government resources is this really a macroeconomic objective that they should pursue remember that's the question we're trying to address when we go through these different objectives and some people would say no it's really not that important and not everybody uses job centers and usually when people are between jobs like they get a job pretty easily it's not that much of an issue like it's just not very significant as most economists would say. Then the fourth type is a classical unemployment, i.e. Um, where you have supply side issues. So minimum wage may be too high or benefits too high that people are not incentivized to work. So um, what could the government do here? Well, they could reduce their intervention. Now, as the name suggests, classical unemployment probably suggested by the classicists because they want a more market-based labor market as opposed to a government regulated one. Now, the evaluation to this would be a great one just quote Keynes he has a very famous saying that I love him for which is in the long run we are all dead and by this he's trying to say we can't wait for these market forces to appear and correct the labor market um you know disequilibriums in like 50 years we need to deal with the problems right now and here so Keynes would argue it's a load of nonsense, you know, um, this classical unemployment, which is encouraging government to withdraw itself. And also there's a data issue. There's more evidence of like cyclical unemployment, frictional unemployment than actually classical unemployment actually exists. It's hard to prove the case. Oh, my God, we're already on 15 minutes. I'm going to I'm going to stop after the fourth goal and I will do um, the fifth and sixth one in a separate video. This is too long. So the last point is you have um, the macroeconomic objective of sustainability uh, of the flows of balance of payments. So essentially what we're trying to say here is that a nation should not be export determined or import, de uh, import determined determines not even the right word dependent it shouldn't be dependent on imports or exports it should be just right and when we're talking about western economies we're usually trying to say we need to reduce like um the persistent deficits that we find our current account balance of payments remember here i'm talking only about current account because the as economics um at excel course specifies that what they want you to know about is the current account not the other accounts so even though you can talk about speculation your analysis should focus on the current account which is goods and services right so why would we want to do this why would a government pursue this well basically they would pursue this because if you have a persistent deficit it implies you're getting poorer over time and if you're getting poorer you're gonna have more unemployment basically it's a downward spiral for the economy so some people would um say but we shouldn't focus on balance of payments, even though of these potentially terrible consequences, which is because if we had a surplus, we would have issues too. And those would revolve around inflation. And we've already talked about how problematic inflation can be. The other thing is, if you just float the exchange rate, many people say, well, you can solve the problem. However, as we've seen in Thailand, for example, when they float to the exchange rate, you know, that didn't solve any balance of payments issues for them, even though there were completely different case. I'm just name dropping so that in your exam, you can just name drop these examples also. And also deficit might not be a bad thing. It might be a sign of growth. If we're importing more, it might be a sign that consumers incomes are going up. If we're importing more raw materials, it might be a sign that there's going to be future growth through manufacturing. You don't know exactly what these things can imply. And the other thing is, why are you focusing on the current account which is goods and services when the main issue might be stemming from monetary policy and speculation and the um, exchange rate so um this video is super long um sorry i've been talking for so long and i will be doing another video now with the distribution of income and environmental goals thank you for watching